All right, we pick up in Daniel chapter 4 in preparation for our Wednesday night Bible study. If you haven't already done so, I encourage you to pray and to read the scripture and just ask the Lord for supernatural wisdom and insight. If you're running to your commentaries, if you're rushing off to look at those little notes in your study Bible, you're missing out on an opportunity for discovery. One of the coolest things that I've experienced as a Christian is reading the Word of God on my own, praying, and just asking the Lord, what's going on here? What are you saying? What's happening? Looking at the context, the people in the narrative, asking God its meaning and also what it means for me and what does it mean for the people in my life. And the coolest thing is to come to some realizations and some understandings about scripture and then to go to church and then to listen on a podcast or then to hear it on the radio something just as I studied and learned for myself and it's like oh man I came to that conclusion on my own with the Lord and so I'm not entirely crazy it looks like I'm able to study the Bible for myself as John said in first John you need not that any man teach you but you have an anointing and he's talking about the Holy Spirit. Not that we don't need teachers in our lives because we can benefit from folks who know things, right? But the teacher of teachers is the Holy Spirit who resides in you. All right, trusting that you've gone ahead to pray and to read the text, I'll give you a very brief overview. Nebuchadnezzar has a vision. Daniel is used by God again to help interpret that vision. Nebuchadnezzar goes crazy, he loses his mind for a seven year period, and it's through that time where he lives like a wild man, eating grass and living out in the, in, somewhere in the wilderness. He loses his mind, but then he comes to himself, and more than coming to himself, it looks like he comes to the Lord and he has this great confession in, in the God of heaven, in the King of heaven. The universe the king of heaven because where he once lived high and lofty as if everything rested on his shoulders as king he realizes that the world rests on the shoulders of its creator uh, upon the shoulders of the king of heaven the most high god so here are a few things that i noted first of all nebuchadnezzar has this uh me, myself, and I complex, the unholy trinity. And so he refers to himself a lot, but I did notice that in verses 34 to 37, after he had gone through his losing his mind experience, he did really testify to God's goodness and greatness. And when he does mention himself, it's very briefly, and it's all to deflect and just to point people back to the most high God who, whom he praises and honors this God who lives forever and ever. And he notes that his dominion is an everlasting dominion. And no one can really say to the king of heaven, you know, what are you doing? Uh, really, really cool kind of conversion experience. The next thing I notice is in the beginning of chapter 4, he notes the most high God. You know, I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the most high God has worked for me. And contrast that with verse 8 where he says, at last Daniel came before me. And his name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God. In him is the spirit of the holy God. And so he names Daniel by a Babylonian name, Belteshazzar, which means Bel shall protect. Bel, which really is more of a title. It's the word that we eventually come to learn as Baal or Baal. But it's the pagan way of saying Lord. And so the Lord shall protect. Well, Nebuchadnezzar's Lord was Marduk, the Lord of Thunder, the God of um, order and destiny. And what Nebuchadnezzar finds is that Marduk is really no Bell, no Baal or Lord after all, at least not in comparison to the Most High God. But it also appears that for a while, while he acknowledges the Most High God, all right, he did back in chapter 3 when he saw uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego inside the fiery furnace with one who looked like the Son of God in there with him. And he says, uh, he says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. So he notices that there's a Most High God, and yet 
he still worships his own gods. And I think this begs the question for you and me. Where do our loyalties lie? Even though we know that there is the Most High God, the Creator of the universe, and we know Him through, through Jesus Christ, we can still worship and honor these other small gods, right? Little, little G, little gods, little idols in our lives. I've once heard it said, we can find who our gods are and where our idols are by where we go when we celebrate and where we go when we have need or when we're afraid. And I think for many of us, we might say that we go to the people in our lives. We go to uh, the internet. We go and worship at our little altars, maybe represented by our phones. And uh, we tell the masses before we go to the Lord and say, God, thank you for getting me through this thing. Thank you for providing for my needs. Thanks for protecting me, Lord. Lord, I'm scared. Help me. Instead, we rush off to our new altars and we... We give our affections and all of our heart and soul and mind and strength to other beings and other things when really the God of heaven, the most high God, is the only one really worthy of that kind of love of all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. So food for thought, where do our loyalties lie? The third thing I notice is uh, the mention of these watchers. In verse 13, he says, I saw in the visions of my head while on my bed that there was a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven. In verse 17, this decision is by the decree of the watchers. Verse 23, and as much as the king saw a watcher, a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree, these watchers, whether they are angels or some other beings, it appears that they preside over the affairs of men, over the affairs of nations. And that is very interesting to me. And they also seem to be under the leadership of the God of heaven in verse 24, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar is given this interpretation by Daniel where he says, you know, King, this is the decree of the Most High. Well, it's a decree given by the Most High through the watchers to humans. We know through Peter's gospel, or Peter's letter, rather, that um, this salvation of ours is something that the prophets have really, really earnestly looked into. And, and he also says... Uh, these are things that the angels desire to look into. That's pretty, pretty cool. Uh, the angels, these watchers, these heavenly beings are very interested in the salvation process. Paul the Apostle said in, in Corinthians, he says that our lives are on display. Literally, the Greek is a theater to both men and angels. So keep in mind, you and I may think that we have secrets or privacy but there is no privacy God sees all there are angels we can assume that they are around and that they see everything and it's been said once that what's considered to be private what's considered to be secret on earth is scandalous <laughs> in the heavens God knows what's going on man so keep that in mind all right and kind of wrapping this up uh, what I've noticed here is that Daniel was sent to Nebuchadnezzar to clarify some things in his life, to put his finger on this arrogance. And I think this begs the question for us, you know, if God were to send a, a Daniel into your life and mine today to clarify what God wants to do in our life, if he were to put his finger on any one sin or virtue or thing in our lives, what would it be? What would it be? And what would we have to lose in order to learn our lesson. As Nebuchadnezzar lost his mind and his dignity, and for a time it appears he lost his kingdom, but um, he, he came to know the God of heaven. What is it that we would have to lose? Hopefully we don't have to lose anything. We can just humble ourselves. As the Bible says, humble yourselves into the mighty hand of God, and he will lift you up. He will lift you up. Finally, I noticed that it seemed Babylon carried on just fine without Nebuchadnezzar. Years ago, I had a supervisor, a friend of mine, tell me as I was a supervisor, and he saw me just working really hard on stuff for my people. And, uh, and he said, Jason, you know, if you fell off the face of the planet tomorrow, it's really not a sign of good leadership if the shop could, didn't run. It's, it's kind of a sign of bad leadership because you should always be training your replacement. 
So keep that in mind. You know, moms and dads, I'm not saying if you weren't around that it wouldn't matter or your kids wouldn't notice you were gone. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying that maybe we could raise our kids in a way to where they're a little less dependent on us. That's the goal. Where we want to raise up not just good citizens, but good capable, godly people who can go out into the world and fend for themselves and be good leaders themselves, right? So remember, it's not about us. It's not all about us. It certainly wasn't all about Nebuchadnezzar. If anything, we can really give more credit to the King of Heaven and the Most High God in our lives, in our marriages, in our units, uh, in the PCS process, whatever it is that we're going through to acknowledge the Most High God. God bless you guys. Look forward to connecting with you in our Zoom chat. And remember, as always, God will never leave you nor forsake you.